it will be lots of information. It's going to be very educational. Maybe you've heard some of these topics from my Instagram or from my lectures, but there will be some new information as well. And uh, it's, um, it's always um, good to repeat, even if you heard something before. Uh, okay, so a little bit of history. It's, um, it's quite uh, fascinating that uh, lead has been known to humans for about 8,000 years old. And uh, ancient um, or first inhabitants of North America used lead as a body paint and ceremonial powders. Ancient uh, Egyptians, they used uh, lead in, uh, in pottery. Um, they make soldiers, they uh, decorate different objects, like ornamental objects. Chinese, in later time, like 4,000 years ago, used lead to make coins as the same as Greeks and Romans. Romans, uh, they used um, lead pipes to uh, transmit the water in the aquifers. And here's the photo I took in Pompeii. This is a piece of lead uh, pipe that preserved there. And uh, that's how they used to deliver water and drink it. But what is also interesting, uh, Romans used to put the lead into their wine to make it sweeter. So it's not just they were drinking it in water, but also in wine. And then recent research actually from um, UK shows that um, Romans possibly, there's a big theory right now that their civilization um, was degraded because of lead poisoning. Because about 40% of population uh, had, um, ex were exposed to lead and the scientists um, uh, screened their skeletons they found with these ancient uh, bodies um, and found uh, lead in their bones. And in a few slides, we will learn what lead does to our cognitive development. So it actually affects um, human health, cognitive development, and IQ. So right now, there's this theory that the Roman Empire collapsed because of this lead uh, exposure, at least partially. And uh, plumbum, we, you know, plumber, uh, plumbum, it actually comes from Roman word, and it means uh, lead and Latin, uh, even in... Um, Plumbum is the lead symbol in chemistry. Uh, so that's what they use for water sprouts. So. A little bit later time, it's uh, the science uh, article published uh, a couple months ago. UK farmers was, uh, was fascinated by that. They mined and smelted so much lead that uh, it left toxic traces in their bodies. Winds, uh, blue lead um, does into glaciers. It, which were 1,500 kilometers away in the Swiss Alps. A lead tracks silver production uh, because it's often found in the same ore. So lead spiked when... Alexa ma, it was responding to me right now because she thought I was talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> All these technologies. <laughs> uh, so the uh, lead spiked when the kings uh, took power uh, minted silver coins, built cathedrals and castles, levels plunged when plagues, wars, or other city, or other crises slowed um, mining and the air cleared. Uh, the highest levels of lead pollution um, uh, was like in the um, 1170s and 1220s, uh, which actually matched the records of 1890s, so it was like industrial revolution or a little bit later. Uh, during the summer months, lead-laced winds blew the um, to the glacier from the northwest uh, Great Britain, and in summer, uh, like spring or fall, between spring and fall harvest, there was also very, um, a very big peak of uh, for lead mined by the farmers. So pollution peaked uh, very interestingly when Henry II uh, made uh, made up with the Pope and had massive lead orders for building roofs, gutters, and uh, cisterns, which are reflected in the taxes on mines in the Peak District and um, uh, in the, uh, some parts of the Northern England. So scientists were, find, were able to find this interesting correlation between lead pollution, farmers who mined that, and taxes in peoples. And nowadays, 
uh, lead, and this is lead uh, in paint and gasoline. That's what our generation did, or like generation before us. In 20th century, you can see lead was commonly used in paint because it improved its quality and gave this nice whitish color, and in gasoline. And then in uh, 1978, they uh, ex um, accepted a law, like New Clear Act, decided to ban lead in paint and gasoline. And then you see very drastic decrease. And it uh, had a very positive effect on human health. For those who are interested to know uh, about this um, uh, combat between scientists and industry, there is a really interesting book called the Toxic Truth. It's for general public, it's easy to read, but it's really fascinating to, um, to find out how scientists were able to uh, detect lead in the environment because it was very hard. There was no uh, equipment to do that in the past. And um, they um, uh, had to fight with industry to prove it had a side effect on uh, children's health. Um, and that eventually led to this uh, Clean um, Act and uh, there were scientists who were from uh, the U.S. primarily who worked on this issue. And um, it's, it's, really, it's really a great book to uh, read about this and uh, to get to know more. So what happened with arsenic? Arsenic is another big problem and arsenic came uh, a little bit later time, uh, it uh, led and arsenic together actually uh, used in Europe, first in China and then it came to Europe in late 1700s and then it came to the United States at the late, at the end of 1900 to fight uh, against the gypsy moss, which was really bad in Massachusetts and then spread in the northeast. And I will introduce you to the case study in New Jersey where we had to deal with this um, uh, consequences of lead arsenic in the farm in New Jersey. Uh, so the, the problem is that the cumulative contamination of any contaminants used in the past stays, it persists today. And the lead and arsenic stay in the soil. Uh, why is it so important to study? Well, um, because lead, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is a neurotoxin. It affects cognitive development. It's uh, immobile in soil. So it means that it stays in the soil and then people can be exposed to it. And it's a really big problem in industrial areas uh, where lead was uh, distributed uh, by wind, by emissions, by deposition, in the urban environments where the industries were, and uh, mining areas, a uh, really big issue as well. Uh, this uh, lead is especially significant for children because they are more susceptible uh, to pollution and this um, effect of uh, lead as a neurotoxin on, hum on their bodies because they're not resistant yet. They don't have a good immune system. And uh, lead can um, uh, be ingested or inhaled to the body, uh, into the children's body, and then travel in the blood system for about 28 days before it gets uh, accumulated in uh, bones. So it is very important to know the environment where children grew up uh, to make sure there's no lead uh, exposure. Uh, that can be through soil, can be through lead paint, chips, or house dust from those sources. And um, the, uh, if it's detected, then you know you need to clean up the space and uh, or even move to another location where children will be safe. So it's really important um, aspect to know if you have children around. As an adult, we are less uh, sensitive to this issue, uh, but children are. And they um, really, uh, big correlations between uh, lead and blood uh, or in the cognitive lead and blood and the cognitive development of children that uh, um, it decreases IQ. But likely after this clean soul, uh, clean air act was adopted in 1978, uh, there's a decrease in blood lead level and new generations of children born in the US are much um, healthy in terms of the lead in their system. Arsenic is another issue that I studied in my research and it's a human carcinogen. It's um, uh, a little bit more mobile than lead and it can actually lead to groundwater. Um, and also they have some um, health consequences if people are exposed to it. 
benefits uh, of urban gardening? Well, first of all, there are a lot of gardens in the US, uh, like about 18,000. And actually, um, 1,500 uh, of them in, in New York. And the number is increasing. And this year, probably will anticipate even higher number than uh, before. So why urban gardening is so important? What do you think? Why people like gardening? You can write in the chat or speak up. So we already know arsenic, we know lead, and the cadmium, you named it. It uh, can come from fertilizer, can come from sludges, from uh, industrial emissions, from batteries, and runoff from roads because it can use, uh, be used in cars. Uh, chromium can come from treated lumber along with copper and arsenic. So well, be careful what uh, lumber you buy or timber. Uh, it uh, needs to be un uh, not treated with uh, these uh, preservatives. Uh, it, uh, copper come from fungicides and is also used in the roofing and in the car brakes, I believe. Mercury, industrial emissions, uh, crematoria, nickel come from industrial emissions, stellium from coal combustion, and zinc galvanized metals. Um, so those uh, metals are of all can be found in urban suburban soils. Lead is studied the most because of this cognitive development um, issue associated with the, with the lead um, in children. Uh, but other contaminants um, can be harmful and you should pay attention if you uh, do the soil testing on them as well. But very often, if uh, lead exists, it is uh, likely that there will be some other contaminants that coexist in the soil. Yeah, so let's look a few examples in uh, soil contamination in uh, different cities. So here's my research in New York City. And um, you can, if you are in New York, you can uh, look at where your uh, zip code is or like your area, get an idea about contamination. So the most contaminated areas in New York City is in northern Brooklyn, uh, Greenwood, or not Greenwood, uh, Greenpoint, uh, Williamsburg, Bushwick, um, and uh, it's, um, it's dropping as we go closer to our suburbs or outskirts of the city. Uh, who is from New York? Why is this uh, Northern Brooklyn uh, would be uh, the most contaminated area? Why do you think that it is? Uh, well, in the, there was that spill in the Newtown, uh, was the Newtown uh, Creek area. Mm -hmm. That was, was, what was that, like? end of the 19th century or so. I remember there's like a yeah. uh, oil spill. Yeah. And there's, it, there's a lot of industry there as well. Absolutely. Like a lot of like smokestacks. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people write industry. Absolutely. So uh, right, a lot of uh, this industry are closed. There's some, you know, unused warehouse or this area is being gentrified. But the contamination is there, it persists and it doesn't go anywhere and even if people gentrify the area contamination is buried so it needs to be taken into consideration when architects or designers uh, urban planners change the um, environment and uh, this is the uh, this um, pattern of having inner city with the highest uh, or most contaminated soil is typical for a lot of uh, cities in America, and then the uh, contamination would drop as we go closer to suburbs, because it's where more of um, um, areas with you know like just private houses, uh, residence uh, area, not commercial area, not industrial area, like in inner cities. Um, all those now has been changed, but still when we do the testing and this tests are done by uh, people, this is actually garden uh, samples that people sent to Brooklyn College Soil Lab within the last 10 years and we were able to construct this map to get an idea. Uh, if you are from the northern Brooklyn, that's okay, don't panic. There are ways to uh, clean up and remediate it and that's what we're going to find out in the um, in the future slides. So uh, here's a breakdown of some contaminants that uh, we found in the soil. So it's lead followed by cadmium, um, copper, arsenic, 
and then we have chromium, nickel, and zinc. So lead uh, takes the largest portion of this contamination issue, but also cadmium should not be forgotten. And very often it's understudied in, um, in research, so, but something to keep in mind. And uh, cadmium can um, affect heart and kidney for health uh, perspective. So here, uh, situation of children with elevated lead, and as I already mentioned, the situation improved since uh, it, uh, 1978, and this is the comparison 2005-2015 in New York. We see that children tested with elevated lead uh, is much lower than uh, in the past uh, because of all this remediation, all these efforts that um, government applied uh, to uh, clean up the um, environment and put like filters and uh, ban the lead from uh, from industry, gasoline specifically and paint. So right now it's a much better situation than ever before. But the situation um, is still problematic, and you see there are some hot spots that needs to um, needs some attention and uh, find a way how we can remediate it, because people still have old houses with the lead. Uh, lead paint that is chipping off and falls uh, on the ground. It uh, creates dust inside of the house or it uh, chips outside, outdoors where children play or just dust from this uh, dry soil. It can uh, be inhaled uh, or um, moved inside of the house where children are exposed to it. So it's still, it's still a problem. Here's an example of California. We see that the children um, have some uh, issues. They see like 13, almost 14% of children tested with elevated lead levels. Um, and you can see some hot spots around like San Francisco, Fresno, Fresno. Yeah, big cities are still in some other uh, areas quite contaminated. Um, here's a New Orleans map. And uh, New Orleans um, also had some uh, industry in the past and uh, its contamination is in inner part of the city and then it's dropping as we go further close to suburbs. Then here's El Paso in Texas just to show the same story. It's uh, close to downtown and inner parts like it's uh, quite contaminated and it's dropping as we go further. And here's an example of arsenic contamination. Uh, you can see, you know, hot spots in some um, areas. Um, and of course, New York falls into that as well. So how does get to people? How we get exposed? I hope you're not that scared so far. I know I can, it can be depressing. I know but we'll find ways how to remediate it. First, we need to understand how it gets to human's body. And there are different pathways. So uh, their main pathways is the plant uptake through crops that uh, can uh, take it from the soil directly or from um, uh, contamination of the surface of the vegetables. I will come back to that. And then we consume it. And then of course it's uh, ingested and uh, spread uh, in the organism. Uh, through direct exposure, it's ingestion, inhalation, or dermal contact. It's negligible in most cases, but still can be an issue if it's, a, a chronic, if it's a acute exposure. Uh, what is important to highlight here is the house dust. Um, again, the paint chips uh, can, uh, paint chips, it um, breaks down to smaller particles, it distributed by the wind, it gets inside of the house, and then um, it looks through the windows, a window open. It's so hard to detect, uh, and scientists are still discovering more and more effect of house dust and elevated lead levels in children. So something to keep in mind, if you have kids, uh, wet um, uh, cleaning of the house is super important. So this house, yeah, how that should go into inhalation more um, rather than ingestion. But kids do eat uh, sometimes, um, you know, dirt, uh, they play with soil. So right now, ingestion can see that as the main pathway for lead exposure for children under the age of six. 
Another way how contaminants can get to uh, human body is through groundwater, through leaching, and the nitrogen, as someone mentioned, is a pollutant, it can actually be contaminant and can uh, contaminate groundwater um, and then have also some um, side effects. So this is the main ways how uh, contaminants through soil can get to uh, humans. But what is important to know, and it's not very um, obvious sometimes if you're not scientists or you don't read scientific literature, is that not the total uh, concentration that is uh, important to measure, but rather bioavailable concentration. And what that is, it's a little bit of science, but I'm sure you will get it. So the total metal concentration, I will show you how it's measured in a few slides. Um, it's uh, not representative of toxicity, but rather bioavailable concentration is. Bioavailability means of any metal, not just lead, um, it, it refers to the amount of ingested uh, metal uh, that actually is absorbed, absorbed into internal organisms and tissues. Uh, this uh, bioavailability is typically measured on animals in vivo. So the animals are um, tested and uh, scientists would take uh, the kidney, urine, blood, uh, bones and measure how much lead or arsenic or other metal uh, in those parts. Right now, scientists uh, try to move towards bioaccessibility, which refers as the proxy for bioavailability measurements. And they are performed uh, in the lab, in vitro, it's called. So we try to simulate gastric solution uh, by using different uh, pH of this uh, chemical solutions to mimic the uh, stomach stomach solution. Uh, pollutants or contaminants that have high bioavailability or bioaccessibility, depending how it's measured, uh, will be readily absorbed and incorporated into the body, leading to health problems. And pollutants with low bioavailability will be secreted um, and not absorbed by the body. So it is really important to study bioavailable or bioaccessible concentrations rather than total concentrations. What it means for us, what it means for gardeners. So when you test soil in laboratory, you will get total concentrations. And it doesn't mean it's all going to be harmful. Uh, only percent of it is going to be harmful, depending on the chemistry of lead or any other contempt. I'll just speak lead as it's most the focus here. So lead exists in a different minerals and those minerals uh, can be very stable. Even if kids or the adults ingest it, it just uh, goes through the human body without having any effect. It's insoluble. But there are some other minerals that exist in the soil with lead that are soluble. And if it gets to human body, it dissolves and it goes to the blood and then it can be uptaken by bones. And this, uh, uh, um, this uh, mineral phase uh, in which form lead exists will affect uh, uh, what is actually uh, harmful and uh, what is not in the soil. Uh, when you get your result, it's most likely total concentrations. Don't get scared. Think that it's only per, per, uh, portion of it is actually harmful. Another portion is not harmful to you or plants. Plants cannot uptake it. Okay. Um, if you get a chance to test for bioaccessible lead right now, like this bioaccessibility, right now some tests, some universities offer this test, but they are not very common. A test. Uh, your soil for bioaccessible lead rather than total, because that will actually determine uh, how hazardous that is. And again, it's going to be only a certain um, percentage, not the entire uh, concentration that you find. Um, so how, uh, what can we do? How we test for lead? Uh, there is a, this, our research team published this um, last year in the Gotham Gazette. I will send you the link so you can read, uh, simple read and can spread the word with your neighbors. It's, um, uh, our idea here is to uh, 
share how you can test for uh, lead. So the, the best thing is to send it to the lab, to scientists uh, professionally with equipment, test your soil sample. Um, in the university's labs, it costs like $10, $15 per sample. Um, yeah, and Marisa is asking if you have recommendations for lead I, if, during the COVID-19. Yes, and um, you will see it in a second. So since like, uh, labs are closed, you cannot test it, right, in lab. Oh, although I think University of Michigan is uh is testing right now i think there's like uh you can google and see uh open labs uh, soil labs in the us and um uh, you will see there's a one or two that are still open and you can send your samples to but you can do it on your own and i will show you um how uh, th this is first of all how scientists test this uh, in the uh, in the laboratory or in the field. It's really cool equipment. It's called the uh, X-ray fluorescence analyzer. It's portable. So we can go to the field and we can use this machine. It only costs about forty thousand dollars. So <laughs> <laughs> it's for universities or consulting companies. Uh, it's but it's really cool because within a minute or even thirty seconds, it gives us a reading. It gives us the whole um, spectrum of metals in concentrations, but total concentrations, right? It's not doesn't give us by accessibility. And scientists are developing uh, techniques that can be uh, more accessible to the public to test for bioaccessible lead. But right now it's mostly in laboratories, um, but I'm sure uh, soon it will be more available to people. But I'll have a couple um, uh, kits to show you how you can test uh, yourself in a, in a few moments. So, the, um, oh, I will show you a video here how this XRF uh, is actually works in um, in real uh, laboratory. I have, and we will have a we'll have a break after this couple of videos. It's probably getting a uh, lot of information to you. I want you to observe it. Um, so this video we made a few years ago. Where is this video? Uh, in our lab, how uh, to test. Um, soil samples uh, with extra with this portable machine. Fission sample. You can see it, right? The video. Material okay. exists in the bag to create it's a few minutes. I'll create a sample focus. thickness of a minimum of 15 millimeters for a spot size that is larger than the analyzer's measurement window. Procedure. One, startup. Place the gun in the cradle of the docking station. Then ensure that the power cable is plugged in and a green analyzer icon comes on. Turn on the unit by pressing the switch on top of the gun. A green LED indicator comes on. On the touch screen, tap start. Two, initial calibration check. On the test screen, select test mode then check button. Next, tap CalCheck. If necessary, unlock the trigger with the icon at the top of the screen. Procedure lasts about 15 seconds. You will either see a message for CalCheck passed, you may begin testing afterwards, or CalCheck failed, in which case you have to retry the procedure. After the initial calibration check, and before you can start testing for samples, you must first test a standard material. To measure a check standard, we are using the national. Place the middle of the unit measurement with mark on the values for each of the heavy metal contaminants. Next, you may begin measuring your soil samples. To measure a soil sample, use the same procedure as for measuring the standard middle of the soil sample in your plastic bag. Next, press the trigger to start the measurement, 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, record the measurements of heavy metal contaminants in your soil sample. 
So basically, that's what we see on the screen, and this is express method. So it is accurate, but not as accurate as some mass spectrometers that can give you like super precise concentrations. But it's still super good, and it's uh, like new generation um, uh, devices of this XRF. Different companies produce them. Uh, have a really good um, um, measurements and very close to this like very analytical techniques. Uh, so when you send your soils to the laboratory, uh, they will offer you choices. Uh, either you do express method like this, or they will ask you more expensive uh, tests for one sample, like 30, 40, maybe more dollars with, uh, with um, more analytical methods. For your purposes as a gardener, you don't need any uh, super expensive techniques. Those are for scientists to know precise concentrations. For you, it's totally enough to spend $10, $15 for this uh, machine. And it's typically referred as express um, heavy metal assessment. And uh, as you can see here, that it gives the well, concentration of parts per million, or uh, it's the same as milligram per kilogram. That's the numbers uh, uh, the lab re will report in your um, uh, in your form that the, when they give you a result. And uh, uh, it's uh, depending on the laboratory, they either offer you one for lead test, or maybe. Uh, they offer you several metals. Or maybe you can request, uh, please uh, give me numbers for other contaminants as well, not just lead. So something uh, to keep in mind. And that's basically how it's tested in the laboratory with this express um, technique. And now we'll, I will show you how to do it simply with your uh, with the kids. I found in the market very recently, and I'm not promoting the company, I just get this question so often how to test lead at home, that I've researched uh, uh, on the internet and I found there is a laboratory, it's a, a Car uh, Carolina, Carolina laboratory, it's for uh, typically for universities like scientists order the materials from them, but you can uh, buy it yourself, that's what I did, just order it from home. Uh, that uh, I will show you this three minute video. There are two tests. Uh, it, they use a uh, simple kit. You'll see uh, how I did this. It's on my kitchen table. I did this. And uh, instructions are very um, simple. It's what you see here. It's just follow the uh, protocol. It's, uh, and then it detects for positive or negative lead. And another test uh, can be a little bit more. Uh, precise, it's like you can determine if it's 400 parts per million or like 100. Uh, but you want to know if it's harmful or not. So this test will not give you a specific number like in the one that I just shows you, showed you with XRF. This one will uh, give you qualitative assessment uh, based on the color of the indicator. The same as if you do like pH or NPK, right, the same kits, they give you the color and then you compare it to the um, uh, graduation uh, form. So the same uh, the same idea is here. Um, it's um, uh, one of the tests is about like twenty dollars. Another one is like forty dollars, but it has a five um, tubes, so it's like you can do several samples. Um, it's so it's still a good price because it's one sample is like a few dollars. Uh, so how do we know which amounts are excessive? Very good. So this test is already designed. So based on the color, it tells you if it's uh, harmful or not. If it's positive, it means it's uh, more than uh, you want to have. If it's uh, below, if it's negative, then it's not harmful to humans. And this tests are actually based on leachability, meaning how much can be um, uh, how much can be um, uh, can leach from soil. Or, and this test, actually, these kits can be used not just for soil, but for some objects, like for toys, for, um, I don't know, for soldiers, I read, like for paint, chips, of many different things uh, can be applicable. So it's uh, to show how much can leach out. And it's, it's not just to the total concentration, how much can come out. And that's what we want to know. We want to know how much can come out of the soil, in our case, to be harmful. Um, I will share with you a document from Cornell or maybe EPA that give you concentrations of metals 
um, based on like federal levels in the United States. Uh, when you test the lab, uh, send your sample to the lab, depending on the laboratory, but uh, they are not uh, allowed uh, to um, give recommendations. Some of the labs don't do recommendations because they don't want to have lawsuits. So there's some just guidelines that are provided for people to understand their own lab test. So I will just share with you those guidelines developed by EPA or um, uh, and you can see what are the numbers when you get a harmful. This kit is not a substitute for laboratory test but this, this is right now the best option as I see it to test yourself at home just uh, to get an idea if it's um, uh, if you have it or not. Uh, if you don't have it then you shouldn't worry. If you have it then you know you should test it uh, send your sample to the lab when it's open um, again. Uh, each soil sample is representative of how much square area or feet? Very good question. How deep should sample be collected and can you use this test for water also only solids? So I think these particular kits are only for solids and they will, um, when you just look up this kit, uh, I will send you the video for this um, uh, link for this video or you can just you go, go to YouTube and find it yourself, home soil lead test my or just look up me on YouTube and you'll see it. Um, those, um, uh, those brands, uh, they only do solids, I think, but there are tests that uh, do for, for water and you can uh, find them on the market. They're more common than for soils. And so how would you test uh, or sample actually for this test? Uh, very good question. Uh, typically, uh, for um, for to know the surface contamination, if you like for kids, uh, you want to know the surface, like how uh, because kids will touch the soil, right, and then it get to their mouths. So it's enough to take just like top few couple inches. If you want to know uh, the concentration, more or less concentration in the root zone, if you do gardening, you, you plant, then you take a few inches down in the like root depth. So it's, I don't know, like five, six inches down. And uh, you want to um, clean up the surface. So it's not, you don't have any debris in the surface, just clean it up and then scoop it um, like a few inches down, put it in a bucket and then uh, take it uh, a few more samples from this area that you want to study to get a representative sample. So you kind of average it to get an idea of what's in this area. And then uh, you mix all the several samples in one bucket and then scoop one cup and send it to the laboratory or go back to your kitchen like I did and, uh, and do this test. But you want to get a representative sample from the area. And each area that you want to test um, uh, should have different samples because if you if you have different management techniques, like let's say you have lawn, you have ornamental flowers, and you have garden vegetables, uh, then you want to have three samples uh, from uh, three representative samples from these locations. Or if you test like your vegetable garden versus uh, surrounding areas next to your house foundation those also should be different um, samples if you have if you live uh, on a hill or like in the middle uh, you want to test soils it's on the hill and then on the valley uh, at the bottom part because the elevation uh, will also affect um, the concentrations uh, so then um, if you have different um, maybe like moisture content in your garden like one area of your garden is always wet you know like you have very high water table that's another sample or the sample that is uh, always dry uh, it's another if you grow different vegetables um, as you have a big garden you have different vegetables set up so maybe you want to uh, sample in those areas as well uh, so just keep in mind if you have different soil management, if your area is different, then you should uh, get representative samples from all those areas. Okay? And top few inches um, is enough, mix it well and then uh, follow the procedure. Okay, so now let's watch uh, this uh, short video and after that we'll have five minutes break.
you want a while half full with a soil sample that is well mixed and air dried. Add contents of a one of bottle of reagent A to the soil sample. Place the cap on the vial and shake the content vigorously for 30 seconds. Remove one test tube from the foil packet. Keep one test tube into the vial for five seconds. After 10 minutes, dip the test tube for five seconds with a constant gentle back and forth motion in a half of cup of fresh tap water. Remove this strip and match to the color chart below. Obtain a representative sample of, of dry soil from the area you wish to test. Transfer half of the spoon of soil into a glass measuring cup um, or lead-free container like plastic or glass. And then add 250 ml or one cup of uh, white vinegar. How to stand uncovered for a minimum of four hours and then follow the procedure further. After allowing to stand them in vinegar for at least four hours, fill the supplied plastic test tubes about one fourth uh, full with the test vinegar. Activate this factor by inserting it into the indicator solution. Place activated swab tip into the vinegar solution. Replace cap and invert the tube once to mix. If after about 30 seconds the resulting solution remains clear it, um, or turns milky or white, there is no leachable lead. If the resulting solution turns even slightly yellow, brown, or black, the item contains leachable lead. Black color shows there is a more than 50 parts per million of leachable lead. So here's an example of where I had my um, sample very contaminated. I, you know, I purposely wanted to show how contamination um, looks like. And, oops. Uh, eat your soil and we'll uh, talk about most of them in the next slide. So if you uh, have a general use, if it's a forest, if it's a park, recreational areas, if you're like landscape designer or urban planner and the contaminated area can be covered by vegetation. You can grow some uh, seeds, uh, grasses, and um, it's not going to be um, exposed to people. If it's ornamental gardens, you could do cover crops, you can do some fight remediation, we'll touch base on that in a few slides. Uh, but you're probably mostly concerned with uh, home gardening and food producing gardens. Uh, what we can do? We can build raised beds, we can do crop selection, uh, we can do different amendments and we can cover it with mulch or grass cover, we can see that as a way of mulching soil. Uh, amendments can be different and uh, I will uh, share with you uh, in the next uh, slides uh, what uh, phosphates can do, what biochar is, what biosolids are, how manure can be used um, and even lime and uh, something to keep in mind and no possibility is perfect, there are always some limitations but it's important to know so you know how to overcome them. Uh, this is the remedial options that are uh, available for contaminated soil, not necessarily available to regular 
people because it requires like machines or some some uh, knowledge but just for you to get an idea this exists in the world and then we move to home uh, home remediation uh, households can be remediated through immobilization extraction and isolation in short words, immobilization means that we change the chemistry of the soil to make sure that contaminants change the form, change its mineral form, and it becomes less bioavailable. So it's not, uh, it's not harmful to humans. Uh, extraction is when we take this um, outside, uh, if it's ex situ, it means we take it outside of the field. In situ means there's a remediation happening inside, uh, in, in the field, the contaminated area. Uh, so it, uh, some techniques uh, can be chemical, they can be physical, they sometimes even do like uh, electricity or some uh, use of um, gases. It uh, can be very technical and expensive. And it is done on very polluted soils in large areas. Um, Sometimes it, it can be also in other ways like isolation is by taking it and putting it in a landfill, which is a common practice, uh, or capping it to bring a new soil and uh, put on top so we bury the layers underneath. Uh, but these are for the most part, very technical and not available for home gardeners, right? Or they are, but they're super expensive. So what can we do uh, in uh, urban uh, gardens? I'll show you examples. Uh, this is a case studies from my uh, research. Uh, it's quite interesting that uh, uh, this uh, uh, garden, Stern Community Garden in Brooklyn was featured back in 2014 in the New York Post saying that this, uh, the uh, garden was so contaminated, even caused cancer to people, which was not entirely true. Uh, we uh, went to uh, the same year in the summer uh, to the garden. We tested the entire garden soil, it's our team, uh, with the XRF, you see this uh, thing that uh, I showed you before, the device. We test the garden and we found there was only one tiny part of the garden that was actually contaminated and not the uh, in, not the whole thing. Uh, so the most of the garden was safe for people to garden, but only one area that is fenced was contaminated. And we did the testing there. We applied different uh, amendments. Uh, in literature, you will find that uh, uh, scientists um, advise to amend soil with phosphates with phosphate fertilizers. Why is that? And we, uh, we did this experiment. Uh, it's phosphorus is known to form very stable mineral with lead. It's called pyromorphite. And this pyromorphite, uh, once it's formed, it's super stable, it's insoluble, meaning it cannot be um, uptaken by bones and cannot be dissolved in blood. So people who uh, take it up, it, it just goes through the human body without having any side effect. So that's really good to have this pyromorphite in the soil. But what we found is a little bit tricky to form this uh, pyromorphite in the gardens by not having some scientific knowledge. And the plants react differently on this. So we did some, um, some science, some uh, testing in the um, uh, experiments in the garden. And what we found that uh, the problem in this particular side in the garden uh, was not from lead, but actually from arsenic. So the arsenic was more bioaccessible than lead. And uh, the trick is that when we add phosphorus to arsenic contaminated soil, arsenic becomes more bioaccessible. So it's important to know not just lead in your garden, but other contaminants because they have sometimes very different side effects. Lead can stabilize phosphorus, but uh, I mean, phosphorus can stabilize lead, but phosphorus can mobilize, making arsenic more uh, haz hazardous, more leachable because of some chemistry between these elements and soil. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Uh, we found that uh, vegetables reacted differently on amendments. As you can see here, kale was really, like it was safe before we did experiments and after we added some uh, amendments with the sulfur because we wanted to uh, make soil a little bit more acidic to bring, um, 
to make phosphorus that was already in soil more available. So it, the, the chemistry would take care of itself and uh, lead will bind or arsenic. But it didn't happen. You see, it became more available. Um, so we, we, this, uh, the short story here, without going too much detail, that uh, plants react differently on amendments and phosphorus may trigger um, arsenic uh, when we add it to treat lead. So what is the solution, right? If we cannot add this phosphorus, if it's very hard to uh, figure out how much you need to add because you need to know how much you have, do some math or chemistry and add more to make sure it um, it works chemically. It's really hard for home gardener to figure this out, right? Because like scientists will spend days and days to do these calculations. For home gardeners, it's it's tricky. Uh, what uh, what uh, uh, and I will tell you what we can do. Other uh, experiments we had in New Jersey was really interesting site Duke's farm. Maybe you heard. We also did a bunch of different experiments and we saw um, how again phosphorus was not as effective as amendment compared to compost. Uh, uh, amendments again gave us different results and um, uh, crops were really um, uh, not responding as we predicted. And we also found that um, here on this slide, uh, we had uh, crops that were more important than amendment type. So it's really more important to know uh, what you can grow in the soil, in contaminated soil, knowing how much you have in the soil, uh, of how much metals you can in the soil. Our studies show that uh, root vegetables uh, have uh, higher concentrations of metals followed by leafy greens and then by um, uh, fruit vegetables. And you can see here that lead had a preference for, car uh, carrots had a preference for lead and it accumulates inside in the core. You know, when you cut the um, core section of a carrot, you see core inside, right? So this core uh, sucks all the metals, like especially lead in it. So peeling carrot growing in contaminated soil will not really help. Uh, radish has a preference uh, for arsenic. So it's uh, really interesting that uh, you, uh, depending on the contaminant, you will have different response of vegetables. So it's important to know what contaminants you have uh, at which concentrations and then match plants to grow in that soil. Um, and uh, I'll give you, I will share with you some resources and you can get an idea of what you can grow in and which concentrations. Uh, this is the research from Cornell University. I like this uh, t uh, graph because it shows the lead concentration in different vegetables. Again, fruit vegetables shows the least, uh, the lowest concentration of lead in tissues of vegetables. Um, leafy greens were a little bit higher than roots and herbs were the highest herbs, right? You'll be surprised. So I think it's because herbs, um, it's not through uptake through soil, it's actually splash from surrounding areas because herbs have a very small, um, for the most part, small uh, leaf, surf leaf surface, right? Uh, but when we take a consideration all these leaves together, it's actually a large surface. And then uh, herbs uh, often have hair, right, growing on the leaves. And that captures uh, soil particles enriched in metals. That's why it's, a, it's hard to wash it off. The contaminants stay in this, uh, on the leaves and that's what makes the vegetable contaminated. Uh, our research, Cornell research and some other scientists uh, show that um, contamination happens not necessarily through uptake through the roots. For the most part, it actually through the um, uh, splashes from surrounding areas or because contaminant uh, stuck like in radishes, right? The fruit is grow, uh, the vegetable grow in the soil. Uh, when we take it off, we wash it, but we can completely wash everything off. It has a very strong adhesion between soil particles and the vegetable. And uh, this uh, surface uh, is contaminated. We can't completely wash it off, 
uh, we reduce concentration by washing, but it doesn't completely go away. And so splash uh, from surrounding areas, adhesion of this uh, uh, contaminant enriched particles to the vegetable surface, um, really uh, what makes vegetable contaminated, not just uptakes through roots. And that's important to know. And how scientists came out, came up with this idea, how they learned about it, is by looking at the aluminum in concentration vegetables. This is just to show you a little bit, throw science into you. Uh, we looked at the uh, concentration between aluminum and arsenic in lettuce, aluminum and lead in lettuce, the same for radishes. Why aluminum? Um, do you add aluminum as a nutrient to your gardens, to vegetables? Do vegetables need aluminum? What kind of nutrients typically you add to your gardens for vegetable growth? Um, like nitrates and phosphates? Good, yeah, and you may add uh, you may add manganese, calcium, sulfur, right? Like iron, all those things. Aluminum is not a nutrient that oh. we need. So uh, if we find aluminum in the so in the vegetable, it means it came from a soil, not from vegetable itself, because vegetables don't take aluminum; they don't need it in for their growth. And it's a, a presence of aluminum um, in our uh, samples that we tested in the lab shows it's a contaminated by soil. So it means that we can't really wash well. And we did triple wash. I did it myself, like triple wash in a laboratory and completely still we could not get rid of all the particles. Visually, you don't see particles. But when we do analysis, the trace concentrations are you know, showed up. So uh, um, wash your vegetables, uh, but keep in mind, it cannot completely wash all the contaminants. So what are some mitigation strategies? What can we do about this? Um, amendments throughout res our research show that they were not as effective. And for home gardeners, it is hard to figure out how much to add the phosphorus fertilizers to have this immobilization of lead because it can mobilize arsenic. Uh, the alternative uh, mitigation strategy would be building raised beds and uh, filling them with clean soil or also using compost by capping soil with the compost or even diluting your soil with compost will be effective. And it's also what was shown by our research. If we saw that uh, we had really great biomass, really great uh, yield when vegetables grew in, in the composted soil, you know, it has all the nutrients in it and it's really beautiful vegetables to grow in it, but it also does. It dilutes concentration of metals in soil, right? You had thousand parts per million, you add a new compost, you made it 200. Because you add new material, you dilute this. And then second part, there's a secondary dilution effect in the vegetable itself. You probably saw tomatoes, for example, grown in a composted soil. It will be like really big, right? Or like regular soil looks small. So the second dilution, dilution effect happens in the large, uh, because of the larger biomass. So there's more um, like water content in the vegetables grown in compost, the larger biomass, causing the concentration to drop. And that's why growing, uh, have compost is not just beneficial because of the nutrient content provide uh, for plants, but also it dilutes concentration in vegetables grown in contaminated soil. So compost beneficial for that as well. Another mitigation strategy is that um, even if you remediate your soil, like your plot, right? But your surrounding areas can be still contaminated. Uh, so what you need to do is to cover it with mulch, with gravel, something to prevent this uh, resuspension in the air. Because it can be, um, can go to the plot by, uh, by wind, by the splashes of the rain, right? Uh, so it's really important to have soil moist so there is no uh, like dry resuspension floating in the air. And uh, mulch or gravel can keep this on the ground. So uh, we want to avoid any potential recontamination 
um, of our remediated plots. So surrounding areas are also important to take care. Uh, some of the simple techniques how you can um, uh, ad fix this, I'll, I'll show this, I'll explain it in this video. So like it's uh, um, a super simple uh, ways to grow uh, grasses or mulch. So like three, two and a half minutes. Hi, I'm Dr. Wells. Here's an example of a typical urban soil um, in, from New York City. Um, it's a little bit compacted and it has a very high concentration of lead. So what a typical gardener can do is to use these three simple ways, adding mulch, growing grasses, and adding compost. Uh, this is the first uh, solution for remediation is adding mulch uh, to contaminate the soil uh, that will be buried the soil underneath, decreasing your uh, squash and having a dust control. Of course, this mulch will break down over time and the organic matter needs to be added probably every single year. So this is a very short term solution. A little bit longer term solution is by growing grasses that will regrow every year. And uh, uh, just like mulch, um, this grasses will uh, have a dust control, so the soils will not blow away, um, and it decreases splash of the rain. So the soil here is well buried under this uh, grass cover. Uh, fibrous roots of grasses will uh, have also beneficial effects on the soil and soil biota uh, by bringing this extra organic matter. A final little bit more um, advanced method of uh, remediating contaminated soils is by adding compost. Compost is enriched in organic matter and it will have two uh, main effects on the soil. One, um, organic matter will overall dilute um, concentration or total concentrations of heavy metals uh, in the soil because we bring extra material in it. And two, uh, there will be chemical reaction that uh, uh, where organic matter binds with the metals, making it less harmful to uh, human health. Um, and by adding organic matter to your soil, you make it also more uh, beneficial for microorganisms and you bring nutrients to the soil. Um, thank you. So simple ways, you can get mulch, you can get compost, you can grow grasses, cover crops, and it will have a few benefits, not just the metal binding, but also bringing nutrients to the soil and improve biodiversity to the soil. Uh, I'm sure all of you know what compost is. It's super beneficial. I just explained uh, in the video uh, how uh, applicable to use for contaminated soil. Uh, at home, you can do kitchen scraps compost by uh, using eggshells, fruit peels, seeds, nutshells, coffee grounds, vegetable and uh, fruit scraps. You can also use yard or garden compost Certain uh, ingredients you get around your garden, leaves, uh, manure if you have it, uh, some ashes, shredded pa paper, wood chips, grass clippings, and so on. You will find you can find amazing uh, recipes uh, on the internet how to mix the greens and browns. Um, it has beautiful benefits for biodiversity, for improving your um, uh, organic matter content in the soil, for. Uh, no, feeding organisms, but also in plants, but also for uh, forming this organic mineral complexes with metals and the looting metals in the soil. You can add compost either by burying the contaminated la um, layer on the compost, which is like building compost by putting it up, um, or by mixing it in the soil. So you can choose what works best for you. Over time it will degrade, so you need to add it every year. Uh, so what are some new soil amendments you can, uh, you can use? And here's the, some recent research showed that you can use and uh, pick and choose what uh, fits to you. Different rice residues, uh, uh, wheat resi uh, residuals, uh, old 
uh, biomass, sawdust, coconut shells, sometimes like seashells or seaweed used, it will um, give calcium to the soil as well. So these amendments are not just um, fixing uh, metals in the soil, but they are bringing nutrients to the soil as well, right? It's like natural fertilizer. And soil amendments typically have much lower concentration of um, uh, nutrients. It's less uh, toxic to soil than fertilizers, but fertilizer can be too much if you don't know how much you have and how much to add. So some other amendments include uh, nutshells, cotton seeds, uh, tea leaves you can use, uh, mushroom substrates, um, even uh, like sugar cane if you're somewhere in Brazil in the tropics apple cores, banana peels, orange peels, coffee grinds, uh, all those uh, things that can be used. They will, uh, again, bring nutrients to the soil, improve soil structure, biodiversity, and uh, also uh, help to um, fix a uh, contamination problem. So what are the biosolids? So biosolids is basically treated sewage sludge. It's a human waste that is being treated in the, uh, in the treatment facilities and it's um, now commercially available to buy and you can add to the garden. The benefit is uh, it's used for, you know, reclamation for organic waste management. It's uh, to increase, decrease um, organic waste to sequester carbon into the soil rather than uh, putting a landfill and create more methane that it is a greenhouse gas. It immobilizes uh, metals because it's organic matter still, so it forms this strong organic mineral complexes. No one knows for how long, it's a new research. And uh, it provides nutrients to the soil because it's still organic matter. The trick with this biosolids, they are, um, Mm, some scientists are against it, so it's something to keep in mind because uh, they don't know uh, about the disease that can be associated with human waste that scientists right now cannot test for. Right? So uh, it's something like it's uh, the biosolids are commercially available, but they're still some uh, controversial. So some scientists say, you know, it's good, some scientists say, um, no, because it's a human waste and who knows what's what's. Uh, goes in it from a microbiological perspective. Biochar is, um, I haven't heard any consequences about using biochar. It's really great if it's prepared well, if it's a uh, used technique that uh, sequesters lots of carbon. And uh, biochar is a charcoal. It's a, it's a black organic matter. It's, it's like burn or combusted uh, organic matter. It's any our plant biomass can be um, uh, burned during pyrolysis. It's like it's fire, means under low oxygen condition. Uh, this, um, I'm not sure you can do it yourself effectively. Probably there are things on the market how you can burn organic matter at, ho at home and use this biochar, uh, but they're commercially available. If you see it on the market, don't hesitate to buy it. It has beautiful benefits as, uh, as well as compost. It will provide um, uh, nutrients, it will st store water, it will uh, st uh, organic matter, right? It will uh, give organic matter content to the soil. Uh, it improves the soil structure of the soil, creates, uh, helps to uh, form aggregates. And most importantly, it uh, sequesters carbon. That's why it's used a lot for mitigating climate change. So we want to have carbon in the soil uh, to take it away from the, from the atmosphere. So instead of now by, you know, letting organic matter break it down, um, there are some ways how we can uh, combust it uh, under low oxygen conditions. So the carbon does not convert to carbon dioxide, so it doesn't flow to the atmosphere, but instead stays as a carbon and we add it to the soil. And in soils, it will stay for a really long time. So biochar is super good, super sustainable technique, how we can not just remediate contaminated soil, but also uh, help mitigate climate change. Uh, some things to consider when you do compost. So I, I, I like to always have not just the benefits, but also disadvantages associated with different things, right? Uh, when you compost, uh, you probably know what you put in your compost. But when you buy compost, you don't know where this compost is coming from. 
So you need to trust you, uh, the vendor. You know, you need to use a proper vendor or, or test uh, what you buy uh, in the laboratory uh, to know that you're not adding more contaminants to your contaminated soil. Uh, you will most likely, or likely, very possible uh, that you buy in the market will have some level of contamination but it's typically negligible it's not harmful so if you add a little bit of like small concentration of metals into a contaminated soil it's not going to make um, it more harmful you add organic matter that overall will dilute it but you need to know how much is in it because um, leaves that are used for composting um, organic matter that's you know coming from uh, trees outdoors like along the roads they may have uh, not just metals but some other like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons from byproduct from uh, from gasoline and um, yeah, that can be harmful so uh, read the label know it's coming from know where you buy it from or test it to make sure it's not contaminated uh, if you do your compost yourself you know what you put in so then you don't need to worry about that but if you buy it keep in mind uh, manure compost um, you can get manure uh, make sure it's aged and depending on which animal it's coming from uh, it takes longer time to age um, like I think if it's I'm not mistaken chicken maybe like within a year but if it's a swine or horse manure then it will take uh, like few years to age so make sure it's aged uh, otherwise it can be too toxic for uh, plants and toxic in terms of how much nitrogen you put in because nitrogen can burn the plant if it's very high concentration so that's why aging for manure is important also um, keep in mind that some uh, animals are fed with copper and zinc uh, to for, uh, it's part of their feed or like stimulate improve their health so manure can be contaminated with copper and zinc um, again uh, know where you buy it from uh, or test it to to know you don't add more copper and zinc are not as uh, dangerous as lead uh, but you know you don't want to add things that you don't need to have but overall copper and zinc are nutrients to uh, plant growth uh, unless they're at very toxic levels now uh, let's do raised beds uh, how many of you actually do raised beds in anyone have you tried Audrey did uh huh only one person okay i see in the chat that um, excel recommends bq rod yeah they're so awesome i've been there last year and yeah bq rod earth method there's so many amazing compost organizations around new york new york compost new york city compost project you can also drop your um organic matter and um uh, you can add uh, you can take a uh, compost from them and they test their compost those organizations um, I know because we the, the tested with Brooklyn College so yeah definitely good way to compost and contribute grass clippings uh, if they are fresh they uh, would add uh, nitrogen to the soil uh, to the compost so eventually the soil so microbes will feed on that okay so the raised beds let me I found this really cool um, um, urban gardening illustrated guide how to do raised beds so if you've never done it simple way how to do it and there is a link uh, or you can take a screenshot and google it afterwards so you would need different gardening tools that you typically have in your garden and then you need to prepare space so we decide to build your uh, garden uh, you need to clean out of debris from your yard you uh, take a landscape fabric or it can be geotextile uh, it's available probably like on home depot or you know places like that uh, ideally you want to have a fabric uh, landscape um, geotextile or landscape fabric uh, to separate contaminated layer from clean soil above however there are some studies when they do uh, you know because it's expensive i don't know how much it costs but um, sometimes they use the raised beds without fabric 
but it's better to use the fabric uh, because it will prevent this um, uh, mixing bet in between the layers. Uh, then build a raised bed. You can buy frames and stack them as you wish. Uh, make sure they're tall enough for tall plants because tall plants will have deep roots. And if you want to grow tomatoes, you need to account for that because tomato plants have very uh, deep um, root systems. And then you um, put in clean soil. Where would you take this clean soil? I'll share with you in a second. Uh, you better test it where you take it from if you don't know if it's a verified wind or not. And again, you would want to put mulch or wood chips or something, gravel around, so there is no splashes, there is no dust um, uh, redeposition to your uh, newly clean established um, beds. So make sure the surrounding areas are covered so that you don't get recontamination. And then plant, do gardening, and uh, it will be really a great way to, um, probably the best way, as our researchers showed, uh, to do raised beds with a clean soil, clean sediment mixed with compost, if it's in New York City. Uh, it's, um, it's the least risky among uh, other techniques. Uh, because you bring new, new clean soil sediments and uh, surrounding areas are uh, covered, so there's no resuspension or recontamination. It's tricky to do with the compost, uh, with, the, with amendments, with fertilizers like phosphorus. Um, it's uh, easier to do with compost, but compost will degrade over time, so you need to add it more. Uh, but this one, you cap it, you cover it, and you grow in a clean environment. So some, some things to consider. So we just covered that we can use, um, uh, you know, some kind of um, coverings for the soil to prevent um, mixing between layers because earthworms would love to do that. Uh, we can do the raised beds, so we can do, um, we can grow grass cover on top. Uh, we can, um, even if the soil is super contaminated and you add soil uh, or like layer of something that has a little bit of lead, it's still better than just growing in contaminated soil. Although you could grow in contaminated soil if it's like tomato plants, right, or eggplants, the fruit vegetables that don't have uptake from roots and they don't have splashes from surrounding areas. So if you don't want to do any of the remediation like raised beds, um, test how much you have in the soil and then plant vegetables that can uh, grow in this contaminated area. Typically like fruit vegetables are okay with that and they still give a good produce. What is also important for probably like, um, you know, landscape designers to consider planners establishing drip line boxes to cover lead contamination that, um, uh, that can be deposited from a paint, uh, house paint, uh, along the sides of the house, right? So we don't want to uh, it get it to the ground. Um, if uh, you design your garden, make sure you have um, stepping stones so you prevent accumulation of soil and shoes and boots so you don't redistribute contaminated soil in the garden because it's probably very hard to, uh, to remediate the entire yard, right? So you'll do part, but you don't want to mix this in. So uh, be mindful when you uh, design it. And you can establish gravel drive or path in a parking area the same way so there is a prevention for recontamination. Uh, some limitations. Nothing is perfect in this world and these interventions will require continuous maintenance. So yeah, over time you will need to replace it. You will need to replace the fabric in a um, um, in raised beds, or uh, you need to add compost uh, to your uh, to your gardens. Um, if you work in a public space or like even your home yard, you need to tell uh, future generations. You need to make a sign, or like live a history behind the place that the soil was remediated, or that you have a raised bed on top of contaminated layer. Because the future people who will come, they will not know, and they start dig and then recontaminate the area or be exposed to it. So it's important to. Um, uh, to preserve the history and uh, do intentional design, meaning like 
inform uh, future generations and residents that this uh, area is contaminated and you remediated it. Um, yeah, uh, so now a couple more slides and then we have a Q&A. Fight remediation. Have you heard about fight remediation? Maybe someone tried it? No? No, okay. So I see someone, um, oh, Maria tried. Uh -huh. Did you, were you successful? Do you know if it worked? Aha, uh -huh. sunflowers. Yeah, that's a common myth. <laughs> so, uh, okay, before I go there, uh, if you need to renew soil each year, no, you don't have to renew soil each year. Uh, it's uh, important. If you completely clean it and you uh, surrounded area with a, you cover surrounded area with like gravel or marsh or protected, you uh, don't have to even test it every year, like very often, like, you know, maybe occasionally, like once in a few years. So, and uh, typically you don't need to replace it unless you live like in the mine city when you have deposits from industries. But if it's an urban environment, even if in New York City, um, it's good for several years. Over time, you need to monitor it to make sure there is no recontamination, but um, it uh, won't be as bad as you started with. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, so the mustard greens. Uh, okay, so fight remediation. Well, first of all, fight, I mean, plant remediation, you know, remediating soil by using different plants. There are different technologies, how it's done. There's like fight the extraction, there's a volatilization, stabilization, there are different techniques. We won't go into that. Uh, I, I want to introduce you to a fight remediation database at the Kansas State University. Working College is also developing one um, and you will hopefully get it soon as well. But you can go there and see what uh, plants worked in case studies that scientists did around the world. Um, I have to warn you that for lead, uh, fighter remediation doesn't really work. And it's enough, um, you can contaminate plants enough for humans, uh, not, uh, it's enough to contaminate plant to be harmful for humans, but not enough to uh, remediate the soil. Uh, meaning it will, uh, plants don't take as much lead as needed to clean up the soil. Uh, and plants may become too toxic and die before it accumulates enough for lead. And lead is not very mobile. It doesn't really move well to the plant. So uh, physiologically, plants cannot take enough lead to clean up the soil. Although there are plants that take more lead than others, but it doesn't mean that carrots that we had that was contaminated, I can grow carrots and it will clean up soil. No. It will be harmful for humans, but not enough to clean up the soil. However, there are other plants, the different techniques, how you can remediate soil with other metals that are more mobile, that actually go into the plant and then they harvest and then they do something with these plants. Uh, it's actually a great business idea for those who want to invest in this, uh, figuring out technologies behind it, because right now there are even things like agro mining. Uh, people grow plants specifically in contaminated areas with like some particular contaminated elements, metals, rare earth elements maybe, and then they harvest these plants and extract metals from those plants and then they use it in the industries again. So these technologies exist. Uh, it's very tricky and um, it uh, will take uh, for home gardeners, it's probably least effective as just doing raised bed or compost because it will take years and years and years to accumulate and depending on which, um, which climate you grow. So uh, the sunflower is not really working. It's more for me rather than um, real deal. And the mustard greens, we tried in New Jersey. 
and it didn't really work for us. It would take uh, hundreds of years to clean up uh, New Jer our site in, in Duke Farm uh, from leather arsenic with mustard, green mustard greens. However, it worked, or Chinese fern, we also use that. However, it worked for other states, like in California or like in Florida, where these plants can grow much nicer and larger, like have a larger biomass, it will be more successful. So uh, the plants uh, need to be, uh, corresponded to the climate and how they grow in particular climates and landscapes to take uh, lots of metals to remediate the soil. Um, robot media for aquaponics. Aha, uh -huh, so uh, fungi. Yeah, so fungi are used in some, like even bacteria right now. I am not um, an expert on that, but uh, if you uh, if you go to, what's his last name? Craig Tesler on my Instagram. If you send me a message on Instagram or email, I will send you to the guy uh, who is actually working on that. He is at, in New York, Craig. He is an expert on mushrooms and uh, he is looking into remediation with fungi. Um, I've read some studies and it looks like it is, it's promising and fungi may be the next uh, generation of uh, remediation. Um, Te techniques, technologies uh, for the soil. Uh, mugwort, yeah, I heard about mugwort. So um, again, it's uh, for lead. It's not. Um, it's not going to be as effective. It probably takes lead, and but it's not enough to clean up the soil within reasonable number of years. Uh, so it may, it will uh, take, it will contaminate the plant, but not enough to clean it up completely. So for lead, for other metals, uh, maybe it's a better um, situation. Um, so for the grow bed media, do you mean grow bed? What was grow bed? Like just a raised bed, or something else? I've never heard of grow bed. It's because maybe it's related to aquaponics and I don't know about aquaponics, unfortunately. Okay, so then how the sediment, where we take sediment and um, you may heard of it, a clean soil bank in New York, they distribute the clean sediment. It's a sandy sediment native to New York. Uh, that uh, can be um, uh, distributed to community organizations. Uh, it's sand, so it's clean and it's pristine. And if we uh, uh, mix it up with the compost, it will give us really clean soil. So when you build your raised bed, you're looking for uh, media to fill your raised beds. Look up uh, programs. Uh, if you're not in New York, other areas, like I know in New Orleans, they're using Mississippi sediment for uh, uh, remediations. So in your areas and maybe other countries, since we have some representative from Europe, uh, you will find uh, other organizations that use uh, uh, local sediment to distribute uh, in um, uh, in parks or gardens. And that would be good because you uh, one, you're recycling or upcycling sediment that is native to the area. So you don't, it's not transported uh, to other regions. Um, and uh, it's a uh, clean, uh, in this case, it's a glacier sediment or if it's like river sediment, um, it, it's clean sediment. Uh, it's not uh, rich in nutrients because it's a sediment. So you would need organic matter uh, to, uh, give this nutrients to the soil. But it's a really great way to uh, remediate uh, the soil or cap it with this uh, new layer. And yes, the soil is free. It's, uh, it's, uh, you can go to their website, just Google Clean Soil Bank, uh, and you will see this webpage that they have a screenshot here. And if you are, I think it says, if you are um, a community organization, you can get for free and then like you'll you'll take a track or two with you. And there's a coordinator with this uh, a program. So you just coordinate with them and you get this uh, sediment. Okay, so uh, to conclude this, uh, what gardeners can do, this is a Cornell um, guideline for healthy gardening. Uh, if your soil is contaminated, uh, one, you can uh, use a clean soil and compost 
we just said it can come from clean soil bank, compost from local organizations or yourself. Use raised beds, avoid treated wood because that may contain uh, pressure treated wood, uh, contain chromium, copper or arsenic. So you don't want that. Uh, cover contaminated area with mulch or um, uh, gravel uh, or grow uh, vegetation around it. Uh, maintain soil nutrients and pH. This will important uh, it, uh, if soil pH is neutral, close to seven, and metals are not really available. So chemistry is really important when we want to maintain um, low bioavailability of metals. And most of those metals are not really available at close to neutral pH. Okay, so if your uh, soil is seven, then you shouldn't worry much about bioavailability of uh, metals in the soil. They will be least harmful to humans. Uh, you need to put a barrier on the play areas for children. So there's no, um, the people, the children don't play in the area or with their bare hands. Uh, keep an eye on children so they don't eat the contaminated dirt. Uh, don't bring uh, tools or, um, I don't know, shoes or, or clothes. Uh, from the garden to uh, to your house, right? So leave it outside. Wash your hands, wash and peel your produce. It will reduce contamination. Um, it may not, uh, if you just wash radish, it may not completely wash off, but if you peel it, it will. So washing and peeling is simple steps, but they reduce contamination and uh, prevention for children. So uh, Q&A now, um, hope you'll stay. Thank you so much for staying all this time. Uh, I think it went, time flew so quickly, it's two hours now. So now it's the Q&A uh, time, uh, but coming back to the original question, is urban gardening hazardous to your health? And no one knows the exactly clear answer. It's case by case uh, situation. Uh, it's important to continue doing research, educate uh, people about it. Test soil is super important. To be wise, to make um, good decisions for health and monetary decisions, test soil and then see if you need to remediate it or not. 